We've got a very special Cyber Monday subscription deal for you this week, which is the biggest discount of the year. For just £99, you get a whole year's access to New Scientist Online and in the app. But we're also throwing in digital access to all our Essential Guide series, free online events brought to you from world-class scientists and experts, our weekly Editor's Highlights newsletter exclusive to subscribers, and access to free accredited courses from the New Scientist Academy all for just £99. But hurry, this offer must end Sunday the 4th of December. Hello, and welcome to New Scientist Weekly. This is the show that brings you a curated selection of the essential stories of the week. Our aim is to feed your curiosity. I'm your host, Chelsea White. And I'm Rowan Hooper. Welcome to the show. This week, we're joined by New Scientist journalists Michael LePage in London, Leah Crane in Chicago, and James Deneen in New York. Welcome all. Hello. Hello. Coming up on the show this week, we have a story about the decline of the Y chromosome, which might be troubling news for men in the far future. We're also talking to the winner of the 2022 Royal Society Science Book Prize. We're heading to the moon. And we have a fascinating story about prolonging life in mammals by sniffing urine. But first, we're off to Montreal soon for the, well, it's the most important meeting in the world. Right, James? Well, certainly it is if you're someone concerned about life on Earth. Um, (laughs) So in Montreal, representatives from nearly all of the world's countries will gather on December 7th to try to reach an agreement on how to address the world's biodiversity crisis. The meeting is called COP15 because it's the 15th conference of the parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity, and it's the biggest world summit on biodiversity in more than a decade. So going into this meeting, there's a draft agreement, right? So what do we have to expect? Yeah, so a a UN working group has been negotiating this document for years. It's called the Global Biodiversity Framework, and it sets out a strategy for stemming biodiversity loss, which is an exceedingly complex problem bringing in debates about conservation, climate change, agriculture, pollution, biotechnology, and on. Currently, there are 22 targets in the draft agreement. One of the most important is a commitment to protect at least 30% of land and water by 2030. More than 100 countries have joined a coalition in support of this 30 by 30 goal. As of 2020, 15% of land and about 7.5% of the ocean was protected. Yeah, um, let's come back to, you know, that goal in particular. But um, take us through a few of the other ones to look out for before that. Yeah, so there are a lot of them and wide ranging. Other targets include stopping invasive species, reducing pollution, and recognizing the key role of indigenous people in protecting biodiversity. Another seeks to end or reduce subsidies for industries that contribute to biodiversity loss, for instance, through deforestation, though that particular target may prove to be a sticking point in negotiations. Climate Mm -hmm. change will also be central in Montreal. Not only does warming threaten many species of animals and plants, biodiverse forests and healthy ecosystems sequester carbon. Yeah, because um, in the climate COP, uh, COP27 in Egypt that we've just had, Mm -hmm. we heard about nature-based solutions. That was on the agenda for the first time, actually. So it looks like there is some link up happening. But to go back to 30 by 30 and, and, you know, it is an ambitious target, um, even if it's perhaps not even enough. But what's the likelihood of these things being hammered through? And who's the leader in this? Who are we going to look to to sort of bring the other countries along? That's a good question. I'm not sure that there is a particular leader that I've heard about driving that. There, there's this this group that's called the High Ambition Coalition, which has more than 100 countries have signed up to it, committing to this 30 by 30 goal and a larger goal of protecting 50% of land and water by 2050. But from people I spoke to who are in the conservation community, there's a lot of uncertainty and even pessimism about ambition at this summit. Unlike COP27 and even more unlike COP26, almost no heads of state will be attending this meeting, for instance. Mm, So there's a big question about leadership and momentum going into Montreal. We need a Greta Thunberg for this, don't we, to get this up on the agenda in in everyone's face. Absolutely. Speaking of leadership and delays, uh, there have been delays to this meeting over and over and over again, haven't there? Is that going to affect sort of how this plays out? Yeah, it's been a long and winding road to Montreal. The meeting was supposed to happen way back in 2020 in China, 
but it was delayed several times because of COVID-19. And then the meeting was moved to Canada to prevent further delay. Initially, some thought that these delays would give negotiators more time to reach an agreement, but the delays have largely had the opposite effect. The draft agreement is full of these bracketed statements that will have to be hammered out at the summit. So a packed agenda will start already behind schedule. And uh, some researchers and conservation advocates I spoke with were quite pessimistic about reaching any agreement, let alone one with ambitious, actionable targets. And it won't just be time constraints that are challenging these negotiations. Much like COP27, debates about the role of wealthier countries and donors in financing biodiversity conservation in lower income countries could hold up an agreement. Another point of contention is this question of who should benefit from genetic sequences stored as digital information, which can be immensely valuable for medicine and agriculture and other biotechnologies. So a lot is happening and is a, and a lot is at stake and um, we'll be covering developments on the ground in Montreal. Yeah, I mean, just to emphasize what's at stake is that the life support system of the planet is at stake. And, and I think that's what really needs to be said over and over again, And it, which is why probably why heads of state aren't going. They think, oh, we've done the climate crisis. We don't have to go to this other one. But this is just as important, you know, as the climate crisis. And now a story about a rat that has somehow managed to survive despite losing the Y chromosome that makes males male. Michael, what's this about? Yeah, so if a mammal loses its Y chromosome, there should be no more males and the species should go extinct. (laughs) But the Amami spiny rat, which is found only on an island off Japan, somehow manages without a Y. And this has sort of been puzzling biologists for, for decades but we've now finally discovered its secret. And it's, it's got some broader relevance too, because it's been suggested that human males are eventually going to lose their Y chromosomes too. So this rat maybe just possibly might be a glimpse of our own genetic future. I'm sure that this is a Margaret Atwood novel, isn't it? I go, you know, the loss of males from a Y chromosome. <laughs> Sounds like it. I've been to Amami Island, actually. I didn't know about this rat. I went there looking for a, a famous rabbit that lives there. There's a, a rare species of rabbit, a black rabbit that lives on the island. But look, Michael, before we talk about, the, you know, the Atwood dystopian future of the human male. (laughs) Tell us about the basics again. Yeah, so a quick reminder that there are lots of different sex determining systems across the animal kingdom, but in us mammals, it all comes down to the X and Y chromosomes. So if an embryo inherits two X chromosomes, it develops into a female. If it inherits an X and a Y, it becomes male. And that's because the Y switches on genes on other chromosomes that trigger the development of the testes. Okay, but why would any species lose their Y chromosome? Well, I'm afraid the truth is that the Y chromosome in us and other mammals is a bit of a sad, shrunken chromosome (laughs) compared with normal chromosomes or the X chromosome. So it's been losing genes over tens of millions of years. And obviously, none of the genes that it's got left are vital for survival. Obviously, there would be no females if that was the case. And in fact, it's actually often lost from cells as men age. What, the whole chromosome disappears from cells? As, yeah, as many. yeah, the whole chromosome, yeah. yeah. It's just not worth make, re- replicating anymore as you get older, I suppose. Well, it, it can be lost without any sort of serious consequences, so it just happens. But it, it turns out maybe that, that sometimes it contributes to various diseases of ageing, but uh, that's a whole other story. Yeah. <laughs> so what happened in this spiny rat? So what, what we found is has happened was that around 2 million years ago in the ancestors of this rat, a bit of chromosome 3 got duplicated. So chromosome 3 is just one of the normal chromosomes, doesn't normally have anything to do with sex, but it's home to the most important gene for triggering the development of the testes. Normally this gene's turned on by the Y, but this accidental duplication turns out to have exactly the same effect. So what this means is that if spiny rats inherit one of these copies of chromosome 3 that have this duplication, they will still develop into males, even if they've lost their Y chromosome. And that's why male spiny rats didn't disappear along with the loss of the Y chromosome, because this chromosome 3 with the duplication is effectively replacing the Y. Well, so what I don't understand is why this happened, though. What is the advantage of not having a Y chromosome? Well, I I don't think there is one. So the loss of the Y was probably just chance. So people tend to think in animals, everything is an adaptation that happened for a reason. But lots of stuff just happens because it can. So what the team in Japan think happened is that after this duplication occurred, 
for a while, there was probably a mixed population of rats on the islands. So some of the males still had a Y chromosome, but some of them had just had chromosome three with this duplication instead. And then we know at some point the sea level rose and wiped out most of the rats. And what the, what the team think happened is this this that sort of environmental disaster just left the males with no Y chromosome. I like that we've got sea level rise in this dystopian future now as well as yeah, uh, you yeah, know, males with no Y chromosome. Got it all. It's got all it the all. Hits. <laughs> so then I guess there's this the big question is could this happen to people too one day? Well, that that very much depends on who you ask. So there's a biologist in Australia called Jenny Graves. And in 2002, she predicted that human males will eventually lose their Y chromosome. When I say eventually, I mean in millions of years. <laughs> um, and so she and the Japanese researchers see these rats as an example of how this could happen. But other researchers are a lot more sceptical. They, they say our Y chromosome is doing just fine. And, and uh, one of the people I spoke to said, what the study shows is actually this, that for a mammal to lose a Y is actually an extremely rare and unlikely event. Let's take a quick break. Are you looking for a unique gift this holiday? What about a gift that helps fight global warming? With Climeworks, you can now remove excess carbon dioxide from the air in the names of your friends and family. So Climeworks is the leader in direct air capture. That's a technology that removes carbon dioxide from the air. And once captured, it's stored underground using the carb fix method. And this is an accelerated natural process that turns carbon dioxide into stone, where it no longer contributes to global warming. So this holiday, choose the gift of climate impact at climeworks.com. And we're back and we're off to the moon. There's a Japanese mission called iSpace, which was supposed to launch on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket to the moon this week. Uh, but it's been delayed because, you know, that's what happens with space travel. But Leia, look, there's some really special and something really cool about this mission, isn't there? Yes, actually, if all goes well, this will be the first spacecraft funded and built by a private firm to land on the moon. There was another attempt back in 2019, but it crashed. So this Japanese company, iSpace, is trying again. It was founded as part of the Lunar X Prize, but that ended up ending without a winner because nobody made it to the moon in time. Hmm. But now the company has actually grown by quite a lot. It's got 10 times as many employees. And they've built this lander called Hakuto R that they are planning to put on the moon. It's really cool, actually, isn't it? Like, um, there's there's real money going into this, um, even though they haven't actually got there yet. And there's an actual race, isn't there? A proper moon race. So um, who are the others that are in this race? Yeah, so Hakuto R is the first to launch. And the problem with that is that it's taking this really circuitous route to the moon that'll take about four months in order to save fuel mm. so that it had more room to put payloads on it. So it's got two little rovers that it's carrying to the moon. But that really circuitous route means that these other two landers that aren't scheduled to launch until early 2023 could potentially beat it to the moon. So they're just those, taking like a straight shot straight to the moon. Yeah. So they're going to get there way faster, whereas this one will be sort of moseying its way over there for four months. So those two landers are the Nova Sea Lander, which is from Intuitive Machines, and the Peregrine Lander, which is from Astrobotic. And those are both U.S. companies. I mean, it's cool. We, you know, we can say, oh, there's a space race going on to the moon. But the point isn't so much about the space race, is it? It's that we've actually got literally missions going to the moon and that people are talking about, you know, a really viable lunar economy, you know, coming soon in the foreseeable future. Yeah. So when I was speaking to the founder and CEO of iSpace, he actually said, we don't care at all who gets there first. The main thing is that lots of people are going. And if there's going to be a lunar economy, there need to be multiple providers and multiple customers. So yeah. having lots of missions going really helps with that possibility. For sure. It's, uh, that is a really cool thing. And we should say, actually, um, when you referenced the crashed mission before, uh, all these are uncrewed missions as yet. Right. It's not a tragedy. All of these are uncrewed. There's been no boots on the moon since 1972. But we will be reporting that before too long, hopefully. Yes, hopefully. Right, let's have a... <laughs> Let's change gear. We've got an interesting story about ageing and mouse urine, Chelsea. <laughs> yes. 
got kind of a weird tale from the animal kingdom today. It turns out that for newborn female mice, they live longer if they smell adult female urine in their environment. <laughs> um, I mean, that is strange, but, um, you know, we do know in, uh, you know, in fruit flies and in nematodes that odors affect lifespan. So, you know, it's known in invertebrates, isn't it? Right, but this is the first evidence in mammals that lifespan can be increased by just smelling an odor alone. Right. Um, so tell me all about it. <laughs> how, <laughs> okay. I'm not going to say how can I how can I smell it, but just tell me about the story. <laughs> how do we know about this? Well, we've known for a while, you know, since the late '70s, that getting young female mice to smell an older female's urine causes a delay in puberty. So that makes sense if you think about it. If a mouse has a lot of female competitors around it in its environment, that could affect its ability to reproduce. So evolutionarily, it makes sense to delay puberty. And it's true the opposite way, actually, too. If female mouse pups smell a lot of adult male mouse urine, they tend to go through puberty earlier, possibly because that smell can signal that there's a lot of males to reproduce with. Right. So delaying puberty leads to longer lives in these mice. Or is that how it works? Well, that's the question researchers wanted to answer. Yeah. So they exposed newborn male and female mice to odors from adult mice for 12 weeks. And they did this by swabbing their little noses with urine collected from the adults. And they also placed soil bedding in with the pups. And then to compare, they swabbed the noses of other newborn mice with just water, the, the lucky group. Yeah. Um, <laughs> or not so lucky because well, yeah. the newborn females that were exposed to the adult female urine went through puberty later and they ended up living 45 days longer. Wow. So that's that's a significant time for a, in a mouse's life, isn't it? Yeah, it's an 8% increase in lifespan, so it's pretty big. But interestingly, they didn't see the same effect in male mice. Okay. And what about the females who were swabbed with the samples from adult male mice? Did that sort of make them have shorter lives? Well, no. So they did go through puberty earlier than usual, which we expected, but their lifespans weren't shortened. And it's not Mm. clear why. But for mice exposed to the female urine smells, the researchers think the delay of reaching sexual maturity slows down development in general and ultimately ends up stretching out their lives. But it's still not clear exactly what the compounds in the urine are that do this. What about other mammals? You know, any particular <laughs> mammal? You know, I know there's one mammal I'm thinking about. Yeah, Is it possible clearly. to do <laughs> Could you do this? It's not, it's not clear, but it's pretty unlikely that this would apply to humans. The researchers say that that's because we have nowhere near the sense of smell that mice do. And also the rates of development in humans aren't nearly as flexible as they are in mice. Right. Okay. So at least we're not going to see this in Silicon Valley, like a craze for... Um, (laughs) sniffing women's urine I I mean it's Silicon Valley so you never know (laughs) (laughs) now this week saw the announcement of the winner of the 2022 Royal Society Science Book Prize which celebrates the best popular science writing from around the world and the winner is Henry G for his book A Very Short History of Life on Earth 4.6 Billion Years in 12 Chapters Henry's a senior editor at the journal Nature, and I'm delighted to say he joins us now. Welcome, Henry. Congratulations on your win. Thank you very much, Rowan. So, look, I've been really enjoying your your romp through 4.6 billion years. Um, can you set the book up for us? It's a bedtime story for grown-ups. It even starts <laughs> once upon a time. Yeah. And I, I use it to tell, I think, the greatest story ever, the whole saga of life on Earth in a a brief and hopefully very accessible way that everyone should be able to enjoy without too much scientific digression. Yeah, I have been really enjoying it. So one thing that jumps out quite quite early on is you, you make the point that life begins on Earth only about 100 million years after the Earth itself forms, which is quite fast, isn't it? Is that is that going out on a limb suggesting that? I don't think so. Um, I'm going to go out on an even greater limb here and suggest that life is the normal progression in any rocky Earth-like planet. Life began almost indecently quickly after the Earth (laughs) formed, so there don't seem to be any particular peculiar special conditions for life to evolve. I think it just happens anyway. Well, that's that's quite a hopeful feeling for, for life in the universe. You know, we go through all these different periods in Earth history. I wondered if you had a favourite one. 
Oh, very much so. My favourite period is the Triassic period. Okay. It starts here, the campaign for the Triassic period. The reason I like it so much is because it's cruelly underrated. The, <laughs> the, the, the dinosaurs evolved towards the end of the Triassic period, as did the mammals. And so they get all the star billing and we tend to forget all the wonderful life forms that evolved in that period, which, remember, was only just after the great dying, the end Permian catastrophe of 250 million years ago, where 95% of all life was scrubbed off the face of the earth. Yeah. But the Triassic period came back as a defiant raspberry, a repost <laughs> to the earth with a, a vast cornucopia of marvellous and completely unlikely animals that still defy interpretation today. Oh, yes, and there were dinosaurs. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, as a bonus. I wondered when I was reading this, what, what you thought of about contingency. So the idea that what evolves is is contingent on extinction events, historical events that have gone before. Um, so, you know, we had, what, 30 years ago or so that the paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould saying that if you rewound the tape of life, you would end up getting a completely different set of life forms today. Uh, I wonder what your thinking is on that now. Um, I think that view is absolutely right. Uh, however, I did discover in a kind of philosophical way while writing the book that life has a motto, and that is whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So that life, once it has evolved, is incredibly hard to get rid of. And it comes back in all sorts of new forms. But one thing that does tend to happen is life tends to get more complex and more structured as it goes, mostly in response to environmental challenges. So after the you know one of the great convulsions of Earth history called the Great Oxidation Event, little bacteria started to get together in collective that became proper cells, as it were. And mm. then after some more convulsions about 850 million years ago, life got together in more complicated forms of cells together and formed animals and so on. So contingency does happen, but there does seem to be an overall trend towards complexity in response to catastrophe and tumult and disaster, which life rather likes because it um, it likes to respond to the challenge. I'm not trying to give it agency, but that just seems to what seems to be what happens. Yeah, and what about the future and our future in particular? Because it's funny, isn't it? When you're when you're immersed in thinking about deep time it's very easy to just almost dismiss humans as this tiny blip on the chart. So I wondered how it made you think about the current biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis now. Uh, these things are, of course, extremely important to us now and, and very vital that we think about them and do something about them. But in the great scheme of things, they don't matter a great deal. Scientists uh, of whatever form who arrive on the Earth in 250 million years years time will find a, a planet very different from ours and human beings won't exist and only with very refined methods will they find that 250 million years earlier something happened uh, but they wouldn't be able to say quite what the human influence on the biosphere is um, very very profound but very very sudden and brief and it will soon be over in geological terms so our, our final legacy will be very very little but shouldn't that still inspire us to do something about it? I mean, we're, we're the only species that has been able to have this, you know, direct effect, so, such a huge effect, and be aware of it. Well, your second point is the important one, and be aware of it. Because when the first bacteria came along and had the knack of splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen, the oxygen they released was a deadly poison and wiped out virtually all life. Now, this mass extinction happened so long ago that we're hardly aware of it. And hey, it only involved bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, and they, poor dears, didn't know what they were doing. But we do know what we're doing, and therefore we can make steps to mitigate it. And I think people are taking steps to mitigate it in halting ways, sometimes two steps backwards and one step forward. But I think people and voters and governments are beginning to be aware of what's going on. One of the other books that was on the shortlist is a book called Hot Air by Peter Stott, and it was a fight against climate change denial. Um, mm. And in many ways, that battle is now over 
I mean, it's not completely over. But I think most people are now saying, as Peter Stott said at the ceremony last night, people are not asking whether human-caused climate change actually exists, but they take it as read that it does, and what can they do about it? Yeah. So the, the debate does move on, and there is hope. Uh, and one thing I wanted to convey in my book is, yes, there there is hope. And although that human beings... Uh, are only here for a short time our job would would be to leave the planet in a state which we wish it to be found if you see what i mean will the last human being please turn off the lights and sweep yeah. the floor? that's all for this week thanks to our guests leah crane michael lepage and james deneen and thanks to you for listening do help support our journalism by subscribing so you don't miss out and do tell everyone about our show and we'll see you next week. Bye for now. Bye. 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 This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk.